David Ryan. <laughs> yes, thanks, Corinne. Yeah, uh, second meeting in a row. I'm here. Who lost the bet? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Mark. I spent 45 minutes on the front steps of the office being berated by a mom who's mad. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, they've started to storm now. They stand outside and wait until somebody comes out to talk to them because we're not allowed <laughs> visitors in just yet. Um, that was after she spent 30 minutes on hold waiting for me and, um, for, the, for the phone, but I was on calls all morning. So she decided to take matters into her own hands. She's come right on down to the steps. Well, Anyone want to trade? <laughs> no. Wish I could help you, Dave. I really do. Thanks, I, Barbara. Yeah, yeah. We're all, everyone's going through it. We knew this was going to happen. Sanborn just started uh, back today on alternating schedules and they're neighbors of ours. So some of our yeah. parents want to know why aren't we going yet? So, yeah, it's all part of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very hard. Very challenging. Yeah. It. It. The issue is space and labor. Yes. Yeah. Because if you add space, you have to add labor. Right. And if you want to add labor, you have to have money. Yes. We can't even find paraprofessionals. We right. got paraprofessionals, and we have one school that may not be able to open we don't have the paraprofessional support can't find them can't hire right them. right yeah what uh, about awesome. teachers david are your are, teachers coming in they are yeah we have uh so our elementary yeah. schools are, are pretty much open uh they're back full november 9th uh, but there are teachers teaching from their classrooms trying to get themselves warmed up uh, we have that whole piece too mary right bringing people back into buildings where they haven't Many haven't been since March. Yeah, we gotta, gotta make sure. <laughs> and you know, kind of going over that. Well, we're hearing a conversation. And... I don't know where that came from. I don't know either. either. Well, all right. Well, um, looking around, trying to see who we might be missing. I think Jay. Uh, I think we're missing Jay. <clears throat> I think I see everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yep. All right. So, um, um, so I, I don't know. Did Jay, Jay didn't indicate anything that he was going to be, uh, no, I'm sure he's on his way. Right? All right. So he'll, <clears throat> he'll join us, um, as we're, uh, as we're going along. So why don't we, uh, why don't we get this thing started? So, um, welcome everybody. A call to order the, uh, Meeting of the Commission to Study School Funding. Today is um, Monday, October 26, 2020, uh, just a little bit after two o'clock in the afternoon. And um, let's see, as, uh, as we start all of our um, uh, remote meetings in accordance with the governor's emergency order, we'll begin with a roll call of, a, of attendees and, uh, and our uh, invited guests today so that we know uh, who's uh, with us. Um, virtually around the table. So I'll start it off. Dave Luno, 
Aaron Hopkinton with uh, with Ozzy the long haired dachshund uh, sleeping snoozing downstairs. So, um, Mel Myler. Uh, Mel Myler calling from uh, Contucook, New Hampshire. Great. And Dick Ames. Uh, yes, I'm here and Jeffrey alone. And Rick Ladd. Yes, Rick Ladd is here in Haverhill, New Hampshire, uh, alone in about five minutes when the, my wife goes to pick the kids up. With Scotty. With Scotty, that's snoring away by the fireplace. <laughs> All right. And uh, let's see, uh, Jay with us yet? No, we'll loop back around, but John Morgan, I saw us here. How are you doing, Jeff? Uh, John Morgan is here uh, in Exeter and a uh, staff member and Good. kids I, are in the house. Except I, I... Great, thanks, John. And Bill Ardinger? Yes, hi, everybody. In Concord, New Hampshire, at my law office by myself. Great, and Jane Bergeron. Good afternoon, everyone. Jane Bergeron. I am home alone in Litchfield with uh, Otis the Black Lab snoozing under the table. All right, it's a snoozy <laughs> day for the pups. So uh, let's see, uh, Kareen Cascaden. Kareen Cascaden in uh, home office in Berlin, New Hampshire. Great, thanks, Kareen. And Dave Ryan. Hi everyone, Dave Ryan from SAU 16 offices on Linden Street in Exeter, and I'm alone. All right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and John Beardmore. John Beardmore, home alone in Hopkinton. Thanks, John. And Iris Esterbrook. Hi, home in Barrington. Husband's around somewhere. Great, thanks, Iris. And Barbara Tremblay. Hi, uh, here in Keene, and my husband's in the other room. Hello, everyone. Great. Thanks, Barbara. And Chris Dwyer? I'm here in Portsmouth in my uh, Portsmouth office alone. And Susan Heward? Good afternoon, everybody. Here in Concord, by, well, by myself in the office, lots of other people in the building. Great. Thanks, Susan. And Val Zanchuk? Now there, Chuck's in his office in Jaffrey, all by himself. All right, thanks, Val. And Mary Heath? Mary Heath's here in Manchester, and my husband's in the other room snoozing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks, Mary. And I see Jen Four from our um, uh, committee services. Hey, Jen Four calling in from the LOB today in my office alone. Great, thanks, Jen. And we've got our uh, Carsey team with Carrie Portry. Harry Portree here in my apartment alone in Dover. Great. And Jordan Hensley? Jordan Hensley, also here in Dover. My fiance is in the house. And I will just note, I did get an email saying, uh, for at least one of our listeners, the audio is a little choppy. Um, so just if folks can make sure to speak clearly and slowly, you know, when possible. Great, thanks, thanks, um, Jordan. And sometimes too, if you're not um, if you're not on tap talking, just turning your mic, just muting your mic, definitely uh, definitely helps uh, with that. So thanks, Jordan and Bruce Mallory. Yeah, I'm here in Kerry Point, Maine, alone, home in my office. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Bruce. And we've got um, a couple of guests from the uh, UNH Survey Center. Um, uh, we have um, uh, uh, Zach Azem. Yep. Hi, Zach Azam, uh, here in Dover in my apartment alone. Thanks, Zach. And uh, do, 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 where am I looking? Don't we have some? Uh... Yeah, the, it's me. Oh, oh, Sean, sorry, yeah. I was I lost you over there. <laughs> no, I didn't want to uh, butt in, but uh, yes. No. Sean McKinley, also from the UH Survey Center. I'm here by myself in my apartment in Hampton. Thanks, Sean. Um, Great. So we've got uh, got everybody on board. Jay will join us when he gets a chance. Jordan, um, uh, how are we looking other than uh, the the audio, choppy audio, but that hopefully is straightened out. Uh, otherwise, we're looking good. We've got uh, looks like 18 or 19 other folks on the line with us today. Okay, great, great. Thanks, thanks very much. So, just a couple of quick comments um, uh, before we before we start. Obviously, um, uh, this week and next week are going to be a little bit, um, um, you know, busy with uh, with people involved in campaigns and stuff like that. So, um, so uh, hopefully, everybody will 
will cut everybody a lot of slack in terms of um, in terms of their ability to necessarily focus on a whole lot of things. But at the same, that said, uh, we still need a lot of focus on uh, on things too because uh, time is uh, is not on our side. It hasn't been since January. Actually, it hasn't been since last fall when we. Uh, when when things were uh, were delayed, we got a late start. We lost um, a good uh, most of the month of March and a little bit into April, and um, and uh, uh, and we I I, I think uh, you know even as you know a lot of us think we know a whole lot about school funding, the um, just the amount of material that I think we uncovered uh, along the way has really proved that this is a, 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 a mountain of a task. And, um, and I think, you know, we'll do our best to, uh, to deliver a report on time on December 1st, that uh, that's going to be useful um, and, uh, and worthwhile, but, uh, but also, uh, you know, it's not something that's going to be able to be implemented overnight. And, uh, and I'm sure um, some, you know, where there, where there still remain to be open questions, we'll need to note those uh, in the report and, uh, and possibly make, um, you know, make additions to it uh, uh, down the road. But, uh, um, but uh, yeah, come December 1st, I think the, certainly the, the frequency of our meetings will, um, will, will be, will change dramatically. And, um, um, but, um, uh, but, you know, the, 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 the commission will certainly have um, have some work to do as it's laid out in the in the statute that it um, it uh, continues until the legislature acts and um, um, you know and and we all know it's going to be a difficult uh, legislative session um, um, you know not just not just because of um, of the uh, the amount of policy work involved in school funding but just I think all the the technical challenges that we're going to face, you know, in terms of um, ability for committees to meet, uh, the House and Senate to um, to meet, and so um, uh, so the, this this is certainly going to be one of the most challenging years in um, in the New Hampshire Legislature. So um, uh, anyway, those are my uh, my sort of start out uh, uh, comments. Um, um, uh, big part of today's meeting, we're going to be um, uh, hearing uh, from um, uh, from from Zach and Sean with respect to the uh, the science and uh, behind the, the the UNH survey of the Grand State Poll, and uh, with respect to the questions that this commission um, uh, wanted uh, wanted answers, and um, and I think we want to give uh, ample opportunity to 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 basically meet with uh, with with Sean and Zach, uh, since they're the experts um, in this. And uh, so it's uh, it's clearly not gonna be a 15 minute um, uh, thing, but probably, you know, uh, take us from, uh, uh, you know, quarter after uh, until the top of uh, three o'clock in order to um, to get that done. So I think we, we wanna make sure that that we're applying the, the right amount of time, dedicated the right amount of time to, um, uh, to understanding what the um, what the Grand State Survey uh, brings forward, and then um, second half of our meeting, sort of laying out the uh, the time frame of um, of report uh, construction, and um, and drafts and review and uh, contributions to it, and uh, and I know you know people have sent over some thoughts on things they would like to see included or sections they want to see included and stuff like that. That's absolutely fine. Um, you know, uh, you know, nobody's like the one person that comes up with the uh, the perfect table of contents and the perfect um, contribution to every section. So, so this is a team effort the whole way, as it has been, and um, and and certainly want that to continue right through the uh, the drafting of the report, and um, and then um, the uh, for the tail end of the meeting before we open it up to public comment. Um, uh, we do want to uh, spend a little bit more time taking a look at the uh, the questions that are still lingering. Um, uh, certainly, an opportunity to talk about things that 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 we think are more settled in nature, um, but also questions that remain open. And uh, these are things that I think uh, the uh, the uh, work groups will be able to 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 take up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, maybe some of them on Thursday, some of them. Um, uh, in the week ahead, 
and um, and be able to to try to come down to you know some answers to those questions or at least um, pros and cons or concerns surrounding them that uh, um, and anything that needs you know further information we'll see what uh, what we can organize so um, with that Bruce um, uh, anything to to add as far as uh, group agreements are concerned just just a reminder I think we're all familiar with them now so we'll continue to operate in their spirit. And I'll note for the record that Jay has joined us now. Yep. <clears throat> so we're we're all here. Great. Welcome, Jay. In, um, in Keene by myself. All right. Noted for the for the for the attendee sheet. So um, let's see. Just going over to open up my get my copy of the minutes from the last meeting. But um, I hope everybody's had to give them a, a quick see, quick look see. Uh, looked to me that they reflected the conversation um, uh, pretty well. So uh, my my thanks to uh, to Jordan and Carrie on on and Bruce on um, on assembly of uh, I think fairly detailed set of minutes. Um, and I would take a motion uh, to uh, to approve the minutes of October nineteenth, twenty twenty. So moved. Second. Yeah. Moved by Myler, seconded by Tremblay. So is there any further discussion on the minutes, uh, changes, um, uh, additions, deletions, amplifications, anything anybody wants to bring out? If not, a uh, quick roll call will probably get us, um, uh, get the minutes approved. So I'll just run through it uh, quickly. Luno, yes. Myler? Yes. Ames? Yes. Vlad. Yes. Khan. Yes. Morgan. Morgan's yes. Hardinger. Yes. Bergeron. Yes. Cascaden. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Beardmore. Yeah. Estabrook. Yes. Tremblay. Yes. Dwyer. Yes. Heward. Yes. Zanchuk. Yes. Heath. Yes. Okay, so the minutes are approved, and um, and with that, I'm just gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Mel to um, uh, to lead us through um, the update on public engagement, uh, particularly the uh, starting with the, um, the Grand State Survey. Well, we had the uh, survey that was conducted, and uh, we all had input into uh, the items that were going to be uh, surveyed. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, go have Sean and Zach go through this. We had a uh, hundred. Uh, we had a thousand thirty-seven uh, responses to this, which is a, a good response. And I think uh, either Sean or Zach, before we start the actual analysis and you take over the screen, et cetera, explain a little bit to the uh, to the commission here uh, how the panel works and how the um, the universe of the respondents is basically selected. Sure. Thanks, Mel. Uh, thanks for having us, uh, everyone. And we'll be happy to walk you through the report in a moment and answer any of your questions after uh, after we're done, either about the report itself or in addition about the the panel and how all this works. Um, so, basically, the the panel we've constructed uh, is a a panel that's randomly recruited from residents within the state, and and that's one of the key differences that uh, our panel has with some of the other uh, publicly available panels. Uh, some of those, they allow people just to opt in. And the problem with those is that you might not be getting a very representative sample of the state. Um, people who might be online more, that's often where they recruit people. Uh, people who are online more often than others, they're, they're more likely probably to join those sorts of polls and or those sorts of panels. And they try to uh, do things to account for that, but um, it's, it's you know an emerging sort of area and it's very difficult to know that you're doing a good job with that. One of the things that we do with our panel is that we largely as much as we can replicate the process that we used when we were calling people on the phone every time we wanted to do a survey. Um, over the last few years, when we were still calling people on the phone, we recruited people to join the panel uh, at the end of surveys if they had answered and said, you know, do you want to do surveys like this again in the future and stored those for a while. And we also recruit people by texting them. And uh, we text them uh, similarly as we would be calling them in that we get a random sample of the state uh, and we text them an invitation to do a survey. Um, the survey is usually about, um, you know, kind of public uh, policy and about politics and 
uh, about current events and things like that. And, and just a general survey. And at the end, we asked people if they'd like to join the panel. Uh, we've had a lot of success doing that. Uh, we're up to uh, about 5,700 uh, current panel members. Uh, so it's a pretty large group of the state. Uh, we've texted a, a large proportion of the state as well, giving them an invitation. And that's another thing that we really think methodologically is great with this is that uh, we're giving large, large proportions of the state an opportunity to participate. So we have a lot of confidence in um, the, um, our panel matching pretty well with the state overall. Great. Now, as you go through this, uh, uh, Sean, uh, why don't we have questions as you go through it? Because there's a sure. lot of information here. So sure. those of you that have questions, just uh, kind of raise your hands and we'll call on you as uh, they go through this. Uh, Dick, uh, Dick, you have a question right at the outset? I do. Thank you. Um, it's, it's about the random selection of participants. Mm -hmm. Wait, just a sec. I got to turn it, turn this thing off. Um, so, uh, I understand that, uh, you use this, uh, approach to get a, uh, broadly representative group, uh, without bias, um, for a survey like this one where, uh, parents are important source of information or, uh, the, uh, ensuring that there's, uh, the point of view of, uh, low, wealth districts. Um, in other words, taking account for factors that you want to have voice, where you want to have a voice for those factors in the survey results. Do you look for that? Do you look at your sur survey sample after you get it to see how are we doing in terms of uh, representation? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Dick. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's something that even though we are texting a, a representative group of the state, Unfortunately, we don't get a representative uh, group necessarily that decide to join. Uh, we do have um, people differ in the, their likelihood of joining based on all sorts of factors. And that's why we have to wait afterwards. So uh, we weight people's responses by a variety of factors that we've identified that are key ones that a lot of other pollsters do as well. So for uh, groups that tend to join our panel and answer in lower numbers than others, um, we tend to weight their responses a little bit uh, more so as to match the actual outcomes that we have in the results uh, to what we expect the, the uh, known proportions of the state are. So things like gender, uh, education, region, age, uh, and then some political history factors we have in there as well so that we wanna make sure we get that representative group through weighting. Right. Other, other questions of uh, Zach uh, or Sean as it relates to the process for conducting uh, the survey and the universal panel that they have. Okay, Zach, why don't you go ahead? I think you have the screen share capability there and just uh, start us out here. I think I'll <laughs> um, Let's see here. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit in the middle of it, just looking at it. So I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, this is what the report looks like if you've seen it already and you can delve into it at your leisure, of course. Uh, I'll just be walking you through kind of the, the main takeaways and kind of orientating you with the report if you have any questions about how it works and how it's put together and, and uh, where things might be located that you might like to see. There's a table of contents, of course, that can direct you, direct you if you have any interest in any, any of the specific topics um, or want to get to the, any of the appendices. And I'll, I'll explain those a little bit later as well. Uh, here on the key findings and on the executive summary page, you can find a very watered down, a very shortened version of what we were just discussing about, um, you know, what the survey actually entailed, how many people answered, when it was taken. Uh, and then if you're just looking for key findings, if you just want to know on one page what the results of the survey was, were, you can see it right here uh, broken down by the different broad topics that we talked about. Uh, so if you'd like to just get through it quickly, you can look here in the key findings section. John, could you make that a little wider? Um, I don't believe I can, unfortunately. I, I have it on full screen at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Uh, is, are people having trouble seeing? Folks should be able to minimize their gallery view by sliding that center line to the right, which then enlarges the um, size of the viewing screen. If you 
understand what I just said. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is basically viewing one page, one full page at a time. So, yeah. um, um, so it, it, look, it looks like it's holding the ratio so that I can put that page on there, but we'll get through it. Okay. Uh, so on this page, we, we uh, show the results of the question we asked where we are asking if you have a, a student, uh, at least one student in a public school in New Hampshire, grades K through 12. Mm -hmm. Understandably, that might uh, be an interesting um, difference in people, how people respond. So this was one of the uh, kind of demographic questions we added in, but we showed the results overall here as well. And you can see 18% of people say that they have a K through 12 student. And you can see down here uh, in figure 1B, you can see this is one of the demographics charts. So this is showing the results overall here, and then it's showing the results among just these groups. So these charts uh, will show the groups where there's a demonstrable difference in how that group responded from how the overall, uh, how the panel overall responded. Uh, the groups that don't differ by very much, they're hidden because there's a lot of them and you probably aren't all that interested if you know a group answered 1% higher than the overall, it's not very meaningful difference. These will show uh, differences above or below 10%. Uh, so you can see that for instance, Understandably, people aged 35 to 49 are, are a lot more likely than people overall to have a student K through 12 uh, in a public school in New Hampshire. Uh, some other groups are conservative radio listeners, uh, central or lakes region residents, more likely to have these students. Um, and again, understandably, older people, people who've never been married, um, they are less likely to report having students. So that's how these charts work. You can see them textually written out here, um, but I think it's a pretty um, easy thing to take a glance at to say, oh, okay, this group's more likely to have said this and this group is less likely to. So just a little shorthand there. We asked people about uh, what they thought the cost of education uh, per student in New Hampshire is, uh, the, the average spent per school district per student. And you can see here, we, we gave people the option. We didn't, uh, we didn't give them a, a multiple choice. We asked them to guess uh, the numbers specifically or, or say the numbers specifically if they know. And on the chart here, you can see the orange line, which is the median, and the red line, which is the mean. And you can see that they're both right around 9,000. I believe actually the mean, uh, the median is 9,000, I believe, and the median is a little bit, uh, or the mean's a little bit higher. Uh, and you can see that that's well below where the actual estimated amount per student is, which is around 19,000. You see that most responses are indicating people are actually slightly underestimate how much is spent uh, per student. And there's a few outliers here, but even taking those into account, most people are, are underestimating the uh, actual amount. And again, down here, you can see that there's some differences in how the average uh, that these groups estimated. So conservative radio listeners, uh, households with an uh, income of $150,000 or more, uh, they're more likely to, or they, they estimate a higher amount of spending per student than other people do. And people who rent their home, people with incomes below $45,000, uh, people who describe themselves as liberals, uh, they're likely to say that uh, a little bit less is spent per student than everybody overall. We also asked people about how much they think uh, uh, public education costs are funded by the state government. And here's a similar chart with the same uh, sort of orientation of, with the lines, where you can see here, uh, respondents are a lot more accurate in terms of how much they think is being paid for by the state. Uh, the green line, again, is the correct answer. Uh, it's right around 31%, I believe, there. Uh, but, and you're seeing the orange line and uh, the green line, or the red line for the mean, being on either side of it, pretty close. In fact, it's a pretty good estimate. I think it ended up being 33%, I believe, yes. Uh, so they did a better job. There's a pretty good uh, distribution here. A couple people thought it was 100%. Uh, a fair amount thought it was 50 uh, But overall, when you average it out in the median, we're looking pretty good that this is a much better estimation of, of uh, how much of public education costs is borne by the state government. We also asked people uh, about whether they think that the state government funding should increase or decrease or should stay about the same. And, and here you can see that just over half of people would like it to increase and more than a quarter would like it to keep stay about the same. And very few people actually wanted it to decrease and you get a fair amount of people who say that they don't know are, or aren't sure. And here again in the demographics, you can see that uh, people who describe themselves as liberals, people who identify as Democrats or independents, people with higher incomes or the highest incomes in Central and Lakes Region residents, 
um, they're more likely, you get about two thirds or more of those people say that they like to increase funding uh, by the state government. And then you're looking at conservatives, conservative radio listeners, Republicans, people who watch Fox News, uh, people with these kind of me medium to high incomes and in those 35 to 49, uh, they're less likely to say that they'd like to increase funding here. We asked too about uh, different sources of education funding. So here we're asking- Dave, this is Bill. Can I ask a question on that last question? Sure. Or should we wait to the end? No, 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 no ask it now. Ask okay, it now. so the question is, um, the question before this seemed to indicate that people when first asked really had underestimated the total amount of spending. Yeah, that, uh, yes, two people. Previous. This one here, yeah, is showing yes, yes, sir. people yes, sir. generally underestimate the estimated spending per student. And so then in that question you just went through, the four, 4A, four mm -hmm. I guess, yep. uh, you disclosed to the respondent mm -hmm. that the actual cost is 19,000, which is higher than almost everybody responding. Yes. Could you yep. comment on the relationship? You know, what, how do you deal with the respondent becoming kind of surprised at how uh, incorrectly they understood yeah. the spending situation. Yeah, Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I, I think our thought process here was that uh, given that we expected that there might be a fair amount of people who might be mistaken about uh, either uh, the previous question or the one before that about how much is spent and how much of the spending is borne by the state government, uh, we wanted to make sure that they at least had accurate information when they were asked this question. Um, if they were under the wrong impression about this or more uh, problematically, if they were under differing impressions, this question wouldn't be as useful, uh, especially to you because these people would be answering this question based on different information. So if someone said, well, I think you know, we spend $20,000 Per, uh, per student and no, I don't want to spend more. And if someone else says, I'm pretty sure it's 5,000 and I definitely do want to spend more. Those are people conveying different opinions. Um, so we wanted to make sure that those people, um, that everyone's answering from the same baseline of correct information. Uh, and also I mean, if, if they don't have that, that correct uh, understanding, um, then you don't really understand what they would prefer in terms of policy outcomes because they don't know what is at, in the case right now. Thank you for addressing that. Oh, sure. Uh, so on, on this section, we talked about the different sources of education funding that, that we could possibly have here. Uh, we mentioned, again, we're, we try to give people a fair amount of information, probably more so than we would in a lot of surveys, but um, as we were just discussing, a fair amount of people probably haven't thought about this too much, or it's a little bit more detailed than some things that we might ask people about. So give people a little bit more information. We were telling them that taxpayers in some communities pay less than $3 per $1,000 of property value. In other communities, taxpayers pay as much as $24 for 1,000 education property tax. So we asked people if they would favor or oppose changing this so that everyone pays the same property tax rate to fund public schools in the state, uh, regardless of, of any other factors. And here you can see the results are pretty mixed. Um, it's somewhat ambiguous response from people, about 40% uh, strongly or somewhat favor this idea of, of making it so that everyone pays the same property taxes in the state uh, or for education funding and about 30% oppose it, and about 30% are neutral or don't know. So here we're seeing a fair amount of ambivalence from, um, from the state as a whole. And um, yeah, just not a, not a clear uh, response here, either affirmatively or negatively. And again, you can see some differences here in the demographics chart. Uh, older people, people with higher educations, uh, Boston Globe readers, Democrats, liberals, people with real low um, income levels. Uh, those people are more likely to support this in conservative radio listeners, conservatives, people with the highest incomes, and Republicans are less likely to support it. Uh, and then we also asked about uh, how much of, uh, how, how much, whether they believe that uh, the local property taxes should increase, decrease, or stay about the same as a percentage of the public education costs. Um, basically, being cognizant that most of the costs are borne by property taxes, or a lot of them are, 65%, uh, we told them. Again, more information, but to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, and here we're seeing that very few people would like property taxes uh, to increase as a share of, of the amount of, um, as the share that is paying for total public education costs in the state. It's only 5%. Um, a plurality would like that proportion to decrease. They, they would like less 
of the cost to be borne by local property taxes. And about a third would like it to stay the same and one in five don't know or are not sure. So here you're seeing that respondents do tell us at the very least that most of them either think pro local property taxes as a share should stay the same or decrease. So, but however, when we go on to the following question, and again, you can see the demographics chart there, but I won't go into that at the moment. We then ask them, would you favor or oppose using the following options to decrease the reliance on local property taxes? So as we said, in this question, we're showing very few people would like property taxes to increase as a share and uh, plurality would actually like them to decrease. Um, however, when you give people the, these three options that we outlined, a statewide property tax, a sales tax, or an income tax, and we ask them if they'd favor or oppose uh, these options to decrease reliance on local property taxes, there is not much support for either or for any of these uh, options, any of the three of them. Uh, statewide property tax gets the most support, but that's still only about a quarter of people say that they would favor this. Uh, sales tax, around the same. A little bit more people say strongly favor, but still less than a quarter. And here you're seeing a lot larger numbers of people saying that they're strongly opposed to a sales tax. There's a little bit more, a little larger um, proportion of people are neutral or don't know about a statewide property tax. There's the possibility that people don't quite comprehend what this would entail. Um, I think a sales tax is probably a little more salient to people. Uh, and there's fewer people who say they don't know or are neutral and uh, about seven in 10 people oppose that. And then an income tax, even more so. Uh, so this again, we're seeing real strongly opposed. Here is you know more than sixty percent strongly opposed, and only about seventeen percent of people uh, would favor uh, an income tax to decrease the reliance on local property taxes. Um, we also asked people. We gave people the option to indicate another income source that they'd like to use to decrease reliance. Um, some people gave uh, a fair number of answers to that uh, in Appendix B which has all of the open-ended responses. If you'd like to, you can go through and you can read everyone's suggestion. Uh, the ones that I can recall that people mentioned were um, a fair amount of mentions of business taxes, um, marijuana taxes, um, cutting spending elsewhere, um, gambling, I believe a few other things, but those are the ones that, that jumped to mind at the very least that people mentioned as-, uh, as Sean, Sean, this, yeah. this question, the last time you asked this question was when? So, and, and, and what was the, uh, is there a relationship to, between the responses of the former question vis-a-vis -vis this one? Yeah, so we, uh, at the survey center, <laughs> it long predated Zach and I, uh, but at the survey center, we previously asked a similar question in 2002, I believe, if I'm, is that correct, Zach? Yes. Yeah, so in 2002, we previously asked a similar question, but um, the problem and the reason that we don't include it in the report is it's not really directly comparable. So we asked people at the time um, what they would like to see done, I believe was the phrasing, about education and, and what they would like effectively to be added um, to the formula for funding education. And, and we gave them a couple options, uh, including a sales tax and an income tax. Uh, we didn't mention a statewide property tax and we gave them a lot of other options too, including uh, gambling um, and a few other things. I, I don't know if you recall, Zach, any of the other ones. Um, I think there was a constitutional amendment or something right. like that as well. Right, so, so this took place in a very different context and but the main problem was that we the question itself presumed that you should be choosing one of these uh, it was on the phone uh, and we did record if people said i don't want anything to change but uh, it was volunteered we didn't we didn't ask people if that was something that they would like and we also and crucially this is the other reason it's not really comparable is we didn't ask people if they favor or oppose to each of these options uh, we simply asked them to choose one that they would like um, so the responses really aren't very similar because if someone supported all three in that instance in 2002, uh, they could only indicate that they would like one of them. Um, here we think the, the survey design is a bit better because we allow people to express their full opinion on each one. Um, and like I said, it was just a very, very different kind of question structure and a very different context in terms of um, what people were talking about at the time because uh, yeah, as Zach reminds me, I believe constitutional amendment was I think right up there in terms of what people wanted to see happen. Um, so it's it's a very different time and probably not something that is all that illuminating compared to- Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Uh, and here we have uh, some demographic charts for each one of these. So you can see them broken out uh, by each one and you can see which groups uh, prefer and or would oppose or support each one of these. Uh, you can see a few groups pop up in all three. Uh, I believe Democrats do, uh, liberals and the sales tax and income tax. Um, I believe Republicans are less likely to favor all three, um, but you can obviously read through the details with these uh, if you'd like. Uh, and then we asked, which of these comes closest to your opinion on what New Hampshire should do for a school funding system? And this is kind of a forced choice question that we sometimes employ when we're asking people to really choose between two options. And, and we certainly do give them the option of saying, I don't know enough to say, um, but we want them to kind of pick a side on either option, on either side, knowing that there's definitely some uh, vagaries in between that people might feel um, they might not entirely understand what these entail. And I think that's probably why more than a quarter of people say 20, uh, said that they don't know enough to say, uh, but we're trying to get people to, to make a decision here between the two. And, and you can see here that 41% of people said that they prefer a state funding system that distributes money to districts based on differences in poverty and property wealth. 31% say that they'd like a state funding system that distributes money equally to every school district. And as I mentioned, 28% said they don't know enough to say. Uh, that's a pretty fair amount of people for a question like this. Uh, so that probably indicates that some people might not really understand what this entails, and some people just might not have really thought about it very much, uh, especially if you don't have children involved in, in the school system. Um, you might not, especially, or if you're a relatively recent um, person moving to the state, you might not have thought very much about this or know very much about this. So um, that would be indicative of that. Um, we here have, see here again demographic charts showing young people are far more likely to want a system that uh, distributes money differently based on poverty and property wealth. Liberals as well, as I said, people who are here um, have come here more recently, people who have lived here 10 years or less, they're actually more likely than most to want that differential system. Uh, and people with the highest incomes and people aged 50 to 64 are more likely to be in this band of people who want money distributed equally um, to every school district. Uh, and if you'll allow me, I will just uh, take a little uh, meander out of the report itself for a moment because based on the feedback that we got uh, from earlier, I did put together a chart that was not in the original report. Um, we had wanted, uh, people were interested in, in showing the differences between in, in this uh, response and this question uh, based how people answered in their support for each of these different funding options. Uh, so I just recent, I just a moment ago put that together for you. So I apologize if it's a little bit rough. Let's see if I can get this up. Um, so here you can see this is again the this is the same response as what we just saw. It's just broken out into a bar chart. Overall, 41% want this differential system. 31% would like an equal one. 28% would like one that uh, or don't know enough to say. And you can see here how the responses are broken out by people's support or opposition to each of these funding programs. And you can see the N as well because we don't want to imply that these groups are the same size. Uh, generally speaking. The opposed groups in all of these are larger because, as we saw before, um, uh, most people, or at least a plurality, um, disapprove or oppose these proposals, as we saw on the previous chart. And you can see here that the people, the statewide property tax, doesn't really make much of a difference uh, in how people feel about this question. Um, so it's not really a huge uh, difference that we're seeing there. Then the sales tax, we're seeing a little bit more of a difference. The people who are in favor of a sales tax are slightly more likely, but not too much. Uh, to prefer a system that has different, um, that has a, uh, distributes money differently based on property and poverty. Uh, and, but we're really seeing one down here in income tax. Here in income tax, more than two thirds of the people who would like an income tax want a system that is differential, uh, but only a third of the people who oppose the income tax would like that. So, but this again, as we're seeing with the ends, it's a relatively small group. This is only 164 people. Uh, as and the overall, we're seeing just over a thousand respondents to this question. Uh, so, but this was uh, something that people had mentioned they might like to see to see if there are any interesting differences here. So, I'd have put that together for you. And jump back into the, the regular report. There we are. Okay. And then we also lastly asked about the most important factors to a high quality public education uh, in the mind of respondents. And we asked people uh, their most important one, but we also asked them to rank the others as well. So we could get a little more granularity about how they're feeling. 
Uh, the most often, um, the most frequently cited, most important quality or uh, um, kind of <laughs> variable, I should say, is teacher quality. Uh, a third of people mentioned that. 15% uh, said career technical education services and other people said higher teacher salaries, smaller class sizes, things of that nature. And down here you can see uh, the chart reflecting whether someone picked this um, variable as their first, second, third, fourth, or fifth most important. And you can see again that teacher quality is leading the field here. It's more than two thirds of people said that that was in their top five. And then career and technical education services again, uh, low income student services is a little bit higher than it is up here. Uh, it's almost half of people put that in their top five. Student and uh, school access to technology, up to date curriculum, learning materials as well, are pretty high on our list here. And you can see here uh, differences based on party identification. So this chart is largely showing effectively what the demographic chart showed, but this is just showing you each one of the Democratic, Independent, and Republican responses. So you can see each one represented by a circle uh, for each of these. And it's, again, this, their top five. So you can see visually the ones where there's pretty much kind of partisan agreement about how important one of these things are and where there's some differences. Um, notably, um, we're seeing things like up-to-date curriculum and learning materials. You can see the circles are overlapping rather well. That shows that people of all different partisan identifications pretty much agree on the importance of curriculum and learning materials. But then you're seeing in career and technical education services, by contrast, only about a third of Democrats put that in their top five and seven in Ted Republicans did. So you can again, look through these and, and see some of the differences. Higher teacher salaries was kind of the opposite where Democrats were more likely to put that in their top five and Republicans were less likely to do so. And down here in figure 9D, the chart's similar, uh, but this is showing the differences between people who are the parent or guardian of a K through 12 student and those who are not. And similarly, there's some things where there's broad agreement. Uh, teacher quality, for instance, the, the circles are almost perfectly on top of one another. Uh, but down here, you're seeing things like social, emotional, mental, and behavioral resources. You're seeing parents are far more likely to put that in their top five and slightly more with career and technical education services. So you're seeing uh, some differences here, um, but not quite as many and not quite as strong as we're seeing uh, based on, on partisan identification. And here again, more demographic charts that show you these beyond the, the partisan or the um, whether you're a K through 12 parent or guardian, uh, these just show you things like the more recent, uh, people who've moved more recently to the state, more likely to mention teacher quality in their top five and, and so on and so forth. And more of those because you know there's six of them. So it's a couple of pages for that to try to make them all fit. Uh, here we have uh, our technical report, what we discussed at the outset about how some of this works and also some additional things about how some of the weighting works, error terms, things like that. Uh, you can find in here if you'd really like to dig into that a little bit. And here you can see Appendix A, you can see charts that show results for each question by each demographic. Um, unlike the demographic uh, charts that we saw before, where it only shows groups where they deviated meaningfully from the norm or from the overall, you're seeing here uh, every, every um, demographic group and responses for each one of them, regardless of how they answered. So if you really wanna know how in this question, how uh, people answered in the Connecticut Valley, you can go through and, and see how they answered and compare it to your overall results up here. Uh, and there's a page like this for each one of the questions. Uh, later on, and I don't know if I probably don't need to take you to it. I don't want to give you guys, uh, make you guys dizzy. Um, but later on in the report also is Appendix B, uh, where you can find uh, all of the open-ended responses, as I mentioned. So if you want to read through those, I believe the main one where we got a lot of responses was that other funding source suggestions people gave. And then Appendix C has the uh, survey instrument. So if you want to read through and read the exact questions and in the context of the other questions that were asked in the survey, uh, you're welcome to do it there as well. Uh, so I think that's the, the main uh, thrust of the report. Uh, but again, like I mentioned, uh, be happy to answer, Zach and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, other questions that you might have of uh, Zach or uh, Sean? Any, um, any general impressions that the commission has uh, for some of the responses that we've heard in this report? Oh, I think Rick and Jay might have some questions. Yeah, I, I can't see the whole screen, so. Okay, I, uh, I just slid my screen over. So okay, so, uh, okay. 
Uh, do you want one of us to start speaking here? Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead, Rick. Thank you, Mel. Mm -hmm. um, can Sean go back to, I think it was page 10. Is that, uh, is that, no, there, there you go. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all. Not that I'm a Republican, but basically because I see career technical education rated highly here at, on that bottom chart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's shared when I look at the New Hampshire uh, Council for Advisory Council for, for CTE programming, which has got a really mixture of folks there. Um, I think they would come out with a, a similar type result that it's very, very important that we have these skills and kids for career and pathways that they're going into and working with the community college system. So I, I guess, uh, were these folks that Ray that aware that this is not a funding issue in terms of adequacy, it's a separate categorical area or, or were they asked, should it be something that's incorporated in the funding of an adequate education? So the, the wording we used, you can uh, you can see actually right above the chart uh, for the specifics. So here we, we didn't tie it directly to education or, or ask people, or, or uh, excuse me, we didn't tie it directly to funding of education uh, and ask, you know, is this underfunded or something like that? Because that, that would be possibly a different question and people might give different responses. Uh, so we asked just very broadly about what they think is most important. Um, that could entail people saying, you know, this exists and I think it should continue to do so, or could also entail there's a uh, deficiency that should be corrected. Uh, we don't really know, unfortunately. May I follow up with one question, Dave? Sure, sure, go ahead. Our, our Mel, excuse me, Mel. Yeah. Uh, teacher quality, obviously, I, I would think that would be on the top of anything, um, but does that also incorporate school building principals and administration, or is that strictly the classroom teacher, or are teachers that are music teachers, PE teachers, et cetera? So that would you know, be in the mind of the respondent, really. Um, we, we don't really know uh, beyond how we phrased it to them, how they would interpret that. Uh, so it would, you know, it's kind of up to your interpretation as well, how you think they might have responded in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who has their hand up next, Dave? I think Jay. Jay and then Chris. Jay and then Chris. <clears throat> the question I wanted to focus in on was 9A for a second. Yeah. And I think, I'm sorry, it, it obviously isn't. <laughs> uh, it must be back one. Uh, had to, yeah. Um, oh, darn. Was it had to do with the, uh, the property tax and was the it, number of respondents was the, was oh, the yeah, extra analysis that you did. The, the new one. So yeah, sorry, it's confusing. I know it's because it's not uh, actually. Whatever uh, number that is. Um, so, uh, darn it. That Jay is just all over the place. He's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, there. Uh, so the largest response group is statewide property tax opposed, but neutral on uh, using it to uh, a as a basis for uh, balancing on property and property value, property wealth and property. Okay, can you focus on that? It says statewide property tax oppose 464. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that's the people on the previous chart there. Um, yeah, but, but what I'm wanting to focus on is that is the largest number mm -hmm. in, in, in out of a thousand respondents. And that statewide property tax oppose, but with the majority saying, or at least a plurality saying, that it should be used in a uh, distribution that's property wealth and 
you know, differences on property, wealth, and poverty. Mm -hmm. What I'm, and, and Mel, why I'm just dwelling on that is an observation that you've made after looking at all these various public uh, encounters that people don't understand how we fund public education Correct. very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's uh, in part because I think, and, and it's hard to read comments into surveys, uh, you know, anybody can, um, but it seems like uh, our use of the property tax has not demonstrated that it could be used to distribute on the basis of property, wealth, and poverty. Uh, and I, I guess I'm, I'm reading into this, that confusion. I'll just leave that, that as an observation uh, because if there is some broader consensus of that among our group, uh, and I think we deserve the outcome that we're getting is that uh, it, it is a taxing mechanism that is employed by the state, but not uh, to deal with uh, the differences in property, wealth, and poverty. I think, I think the issue of the understanding of how schools are funding is, is a problem um, in the state. I mean, the third survey kind of indicates that. Uh, Chris, you had a, a question or a comment? Not about that, so I don't okay. know. Okay, no, that's okay, go ahead. Um, and and mm. mine is about 4B, question okay. 4B, um, because I, I thought overall the results are remarkably, they paint a remarkably consistent picture. W with, with the exception of 4B, I was surprised to see that the 35 to 49 year olds were uh, the ones who were thinking that um, the state government should decrease its funding level since those are the most likely people to have children in school. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know if um, you looked at that any further or I, I haven't gone into any of your backup appendices yet, whether there are cross tabs that are going to help explain that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the important thing with these charts is that it, it shows if people are, are more or less likely to select just this one response. Um, you know, it's difficult to display visually how they responded entirely. Um, but that is why we have the, the tables. So uh, we can go to the relevant one there. Um, let me see here. Uh, I think it's, um, no, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think this is the correct one. Uh, and you can see if you go down to people here who are 35 to uh, 49, only 4% of them uh, want uh, to increase. Oh, wait, no, this wasn't the right one, I don't think. I think it's two, uh, three back, Sean. Three back, mm -hmm. right, exactly. <laughs> this one. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so decreased funding, increased funding, 55, four, uh, four. yeah, that's right. So uh, if you go down to your 35 to 49 year olds, uh, yeah, only 42%, as we've mentioned. So that's why they show up in the chart. They're 13% below, uh, but only 2% want them to decrease funding. I see, okay. Um, but on the other hand, 49% want them to keep the same, uh, which is a lot more than the overall. So that's where, and it's less of them say they don't know, which probably makes sense. They're more likely to have children. So they're in the school system. So they're probably uh, more familiar with this, more likely to have an opinion. As you can see, people who are 50 and older, they're more likely to be in this don't know category. Um, so yeah, the, this group, uh, the 35 to 49 year olds, they're almost uh, half of them actually would like it to stay the same. Hmm. Interesting. You good, Chris? Yep. Uh, other, other questions of uh, the group? So I think, uh, I Bill, think- I, I have just one. Yeah, Bill. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in terms of the overall selection that the question is, are you a parent or guardian of a student? 18% yes, 82% no. Right. And that struck me because, <clears throat> and I went and just checked it, 
the percentage of households in New Hampshire that have children, own children under 18 years is 30, 32%, 32.8%. So I was just wondering about that, that breakdown there. Uh, it seems to be a little bit skewed differently. And I, honestly, this is a question without careful analysis of apples to apples. So I'm sure there's an easier answer, but it just struck me that that number stood out a little bit. Uh, so one of the reasons that might be lower than the 32% is, uh, of course, people with younger children uh, exclusively who aren't in school yet. Uh, and there's also the element of public schools. So um, people who aren't sending their kids um, to public schools might be private or religious schools. Um, those uh, people obviously won't show up here uh, either. Um, you did ask a, a question, an unrelated question, just about um, about schools and their uh, plans for reopening uh, back in, I believe, June, maybe July, uh, we asked some questions about that. And we similarly asked people uh, if they had students or if they had a student in, in school, I believe it was then, um, rather than in a public school. Uh, and the numbers we got were pretty similar. Um, so we don't think that this is, um, you know, kind of an accidental um, lower numbers of people in this instance uh, having uh, children in the school system. Uh, and also you can see, actually, it's kind of interesting to note that in a lot of these charts that you're seeing, the demographics charts, the ones that I mentioned that you only see groups where they deviate meaningfully from the norm. Um, the people who say that they have students or whether they don't, they don't actually show up that much in here. Uh, and as you can see, the other chart that I mentioned where this shows this is uh, here, where you can see uh, the differences and and the different variables and how important they are based on whether you're a parent or guardian or not. Um, there usually aren't that many differences. Uh, there was obviously, as I mentioned here and here, uh, but for the most part, people weren't answering enormously differently based on just telling us whether they have students um, in the school system or not. That's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> but I think, Bill, I think, Bill, you, you do raise when I saw that 18%, that jumped out at me too. And it, it, but it does indicate to me that there are obviously vast majority of uh, our citizens in the state do not have kids in school at this point in time. That doesn't mean that at some previous time they had children in or grandkids in, et cetera. But the point is uh, on the day-to-day -day contact with, with schools, there is only a, a minority of our citizens that have kids in school. And that I think then is incumbent upon school districts to reach out to the community to try to keep them informed on exactly what is happening in schools. So that when the issues that like what we're dealing with here in this commission, that there is, there's a higher level. I think a challenge for us going forward is how do you begin to address both the issue of school funding and the, the whole question of school performance, et cetera. Um, because it's very hard if you don't have children in school to understand what's going on in school. And so it's, uh, it's I think this is, this is a huge, I viewed that as a huge, that was one of my takeaways, huge challenge for this group on how you're gonna begin to provide a greater understanding out there of what, how schools are funded and what is going on in schools. So other, other questions of uh, uh, Sean and Zach while we've got them here. I can't see, uh, am I missing any hands or anything? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands right now, Mel. Okay, all right. So uh, Zach and Sean, thanks very much for, for your presentation and your work. Uh, this obviously, this survey is one of, um, many types of inputs that we're getting for the commission to look at along with the other community engagement issues that we're, uh, that we're uh, dealing with. Uh, you did receive, the commission members did receive earlier today, uh, the initial draft of our outreach packet. Uh, we call it the, uh, the, the rotary presentation uh, and both uh, Corrine and, and Chris have uh, given some very uh, valuable feedback uh, to Carrie, who's uh, Carrie and Bruce, who are kind of putting this uh, together. I don't know, um, 
Bruce, do you have any uh, comments uh, about the uh, packet that uh, was sent out today? Um, maybe if I could just take five minutes to walk through it by sharing the screen. Okay. Um, and with the caveat that um, this really is um, a work in progress. Um, so so, so let, let's, let's also, um, um, Sean and, and Zach, I think we're moving on to another section. You're yep. absolutely welcome to stay with us, but um, but uh, but I wanted to thank you very much for your time uh, last week as well as this week in in our meetings and and obviously the work you do with the Granite State Poll is uh, is so important not just to the School Funding Commission but to um, all of our institutions around the state. So so thank you guys very much. Thanks for having us, Dave. Thanks a lot. I think we're going to, I think Sean and I are going to have to take off, though. That's yeah. Okay. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Welcome back anytime. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Um, so, just to I'll put this in context, right now, Carrie and I are really working on three different versions of, of this. This one we're calling the Rotary Club presentation. So, the assumption here is that any commission member could take this set of um, 11 or so slides and share it um, at a community organization, a community gathering. You know, uh, Chris, we're building on the work that Chris did a couple of weeks ago in making a presentation to um, officials in Portsmouth, a group of what I would describe as sort of educated and knowledgeable about uh, both school funding issues as well as local um, tax and revenue concerns and budget concerns. Um, and so hers was a, a, a quite a detailed and, and sophisticated summary of what the commission has learned so far and where we're headed. Um, tomorrow night, we're reconvening the school and municipal leaders who we had met with last June to orient them to the work of the commission. And tomorrow night uh, on a Zoom call, we'll have about 35 or so of them from, from around the state, giving them an update uh, in terms of our research so far, our initial sort of emerging findings, and then again, the continuing questions that we have. And we'll want to hear their responses to um, where the commission's work has led so far, as well as any guidance um, they have for us going forward in the short amount of time that we have left. And then the third sort of similar uh, information package we're putting together now, uh, similar to this, uh, although more policy oriented perhaps, will be for a legislative briefing after the election. So once we know who will constitute the next uh, legislative session for in New Hampshire, uh, Dave and Jay are gonna be working with uh, leadership in the House and Senate to arrange a time when we could provide an orientation slash briefing to both um, continuing and newly elected uh, legislators to get them up to speed on the commission's work in, in a way of um, both answering their questions, making sure they're well informed, uh, but also um, sort of whetting their appetite for the specific uh, policy recommendations and other actions that they'll be receiving from the commission uh, in December. Um, so this first one we're starting with, as we say, is the Rotary Club version, the you know, reaching out to educated audiences, interested audiences um, who may have somewhat um, more understanding of our current school funding system than we just saw from that uh, random uh, sample of New Hampshire residents. And I'm just gonna walk through this really quickly. This is not an editing session by any means. It's just to orient you to this. This is still a work in progress. Over the next day or two, we, we anticipate this being completed. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that folks understand what the commission itself is uh, in general terms, what its, what its charge is, uh, who constitutes the commission. Uh, the key questions, uh, these are slightly edited, Chris, from some of the ones that you developed. And these are the kinds of questions that we've been grappling with all along, kind of our big 60,000 foot questions, if you will, um, that we need to answer in order to begin to identify uh, our recommendations, policy recommendations. Some givens here, this is something that, that I've added that was not in the previous materials, but just, um, I think it's important, uh, especially in light of some of the survey results we just heard, and in light of, frankly, of some of the 
emerging um, media coverage and op-ed uh, uh, writing relating to the, um, to the commission that sometimes is not fully informed. But we wanna acknowledge that the commission understands that New Hampshire currently provides a high level of funding per pupil um, com compared to our uh, other peers around the country. Um, and that, that therefore there right now is no pressing rationale for adding additional significant resources into the total that's being spent across the state. I, I, I do think it's useful to signal to various audiences that um, we're not, and anybody who's been following the work of the commission, uh, either live or looking at our, our minutes, um, would know that we're not spending any time talking about how we're going to design and implement some new tax structures, especially any new broad-based taxes. So we're working with the existing tax structure. We, we know that the primary challenge is distribution, not net amount that, that flows through our uh, revenue system. We also take as a given that students in New Hampshire are performing on average at uh, relatively high levels, uh, again, compared to our national um, data. Um, we also know that um, the disparities in student opportunities and outcomes have persisted in spite of um, litigation, court orders, and legislative action. Um, that so far, we haven't been able to seem to find, what we call it the sweet spot, that addresses constitutional requirements um, uh, and, 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 and imperatives uh, and um, channels resources to those students and districts that most need it. And that the disparities that seem to be um, continuing are correlated with capacity, local capacity to raise property tax dollars to fund their schools. That's really the, the, the nub of the, of the challenge that we're facing right now and what we're trying to, um, to smooth out. Uh, a, a slide that summarizes um, AAR's findings. Um, this is text version and then followed by um, some graphic representations of those findings. Again, thanks to Chris who recognizes that she, she put some time into preparing these slides based on the AAR report um, uh, when she did her Portsmouth presentation. But I, I thought that the, these, this graph and the next two provide you know, a good summary of, of what it is we're trying to address in New Hampshire. So we look at the relationship between um, uh, property values and per pupil spending. And you can see that kind of dramatic visual representation of what it means when you have lower property values, how much you can actually invest with your dollars in, uh, in your local school budgets. And then the, the relationship between um, poverty and student outcomes. So again, a pretty, pretty graphic and clear representation that poverty rate correlates at a high level, uh, 0.89 in this case, um, with uh, student outcomes. And then uh, again, thanks to Chris, I've tweaked this a little bit, edited a little bit, but this is a nice representation of the, of, of, of the shift that uh, the commission seems to have arrived at, I think has arrived at, that it makes more sense to use this outcome-based approach that focuses on what it costs to educate a student than an input-based approach, which focuses on what's it, what it costs to run a school. So here's where we introduced really the, the probably the most significant, at least kind of conceptual um, shift uh, that the commission is now shaping its recommendations around. And then finally, uh, ending with a set of, as of this week at least, some of the emerging questions um, that the commission continues to grapple with, particularly around um, tax relief for a low and some perhaps middle income homeowners, whether there should be any differential kind of property tax rates. Accountability questions now come up if we're going to peg um, the distribution formula on student outcomes, then how is it that we hold districts responsible for and how do we, what is the evidence, excuse me, that uh, we're achieving the desirable outcomes with a new distribution formula. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, the last question here has to do with phase in over a number of years and that is a continuing topic for conversation uh, and will get more important, I think, as we land on a set of recommendations or findings uh, to help the legislature understand that we're not expecting um, some kind of 
immediate radical change. Um, if this is something that takes time to implement. There has to be some, probably some hold harmless period initially uh, and initially any change in um, revenue policy or distribution policies will have to operate within the context of the um, extremely stressed state budget uh, in this 2020, 21, 22, that is the, the COVID uh, consequences of COVID on state budget. So again, um, this is just to familiarize you with the general purpose of this um, kind of outreach package, if you will, uh, a couple other varieties of it that we'll be creating, but our goal here is that any commission member will be able to use this kind of tool and sort of talk through it with an audience um, in order to help their, uh, you know, your, again, your constituents, your organizational partners, your community partners uh, have some insight into what the commission's up to. Mm -hmm. so I'll stop there. So Chris, yeah, I see a hand up. I, I think one thing I did do when I used it and I had more graphs in there is I was able to kind of um, show which circle represented yes. the Portsmouth each time. And I think that's helpful for people to ground them in as a way to explain to them what the graph says to show, you know, if you're talking to your own district to approximate where your district is on each of those graphs. And, you know, the data that we have in the simulator and the backup allows you to, to, to do that approximately. So we'll um, try to set that up so there's a so there's a function in here to identify, um, let's say Jaffrey, and highlight that circle so people can orient themselves to where they are. Um, I I think let me uh, say Chris, that's an excellent point. I think if we don't have it, we need the underlying data that produced that graph, uh, at least the one graph that's highly correlated. It, it it's it's. Uh, it's, it's almost, by not having it, it almost begs the question, what are we trying to hide? So we need the, the actual table that allows the production of that graph. And that's great that you've presented it. Um, if I piggyback on that, uh, I did one for retired educators uh, in Cheshire County. So I wound up taking all the towns in Cheshire County. Now, maybe because that's only 23, uh, that was a doable thing using the simulator. My point in saying it is that uh, Southwest New Hampshire, Cheshire County, thinking of lawsuits, particularly currently, you might think that overwhelmingly uh, of the 23, an overwhelming number fell to one side of this table or uh, it wasn't the case. Uh, it was that 12 of the 23 show up as uh, lower property valuations and lower outcomes. Uh, and 11 uh, were other than that. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's my point of saying using a county. I bet even in, you know, Rockingham County, there are towns that fall uh, in, you know, the four quadrants here, but, you know, along the regressive uh, property taxation, uh, uh, you know, outcome uh, uh, model. And uh, I, I, it just, uh, it, it, it gives people that context, just like Chris, your, was your objective by showing a single town, mm -hmm. uh, showing that the neighboring towns just have mm -hmm. quite different outcomes, both in terms of how they have to tax and what their outcomes are. Okay. Rick, Rick Van Dyck. Rick, you're muted. There, I'm unmuted. All right, we're, we're getting pretty good at reading your lips. But. Uh, that's good, that's good. Um, uh, one of the questions that Bruce read here in, in this uh, presentation here, should different types of property be taxed at different rates. And within one of the tasks, which we have based upon HB4, we've all seen it, uh, the study, the integration of various types of properties, A, B, and C, possibly into this formula and perhaps tax at different rates. Um, 
I, I have we really uh, tried to define yet what that might mean, A, B, and C? Uh, so, so Rick, we um, we we did have um, Senator Guida uh, scheduled, uh, but uh, but but that fell away at the last at the last minute, um, and and that's okay. But we 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 did also hear from um, from the DRA, particularly Bruce Canoer and and um, and James Gary, with respect to um, uh, the challenges that would be that would fall upon not only the. The, the department, but also local tax collection, if they were to um, to tax at uh, very different rates for different property classes. Yeah, I remember. And, I remember uh, that discussion. Yeah, Dave. not saying that it couldn't be done. I, but, I was curious to know what was specifically was the Senate after by adding that into the legislation. Yeah, I think the, that that's a good question. I think the closest we've been able to to determine would be like quality of commercial property, something like that. Wow. But, it, but it would, um, but we, we haven't, we haven't been able to put any sort of finer uh, link um, uh, on that. Thank you. Yeah, and then, and Dick. Yeah, uh, this is just a question uh, for Bruce and, um, and Bruce, thanks for all this work putting together this outline. Um, is, is this available, going to be available to us right. online, this Rotary Club presentation, um, so that we can you know, look through it and think about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, um, yeah, we can, we can post this on the website and or, well, we'll send out a, a version to each of the commission members. Definitely. And then I guess, and you'll be free to Add your own commentary. Um, add your own slides if you'd like to. I mean, I guess we want it. If you do that, send them back to me just so we can keep track of the various versions that are out there and make sure that they're relatively consistent. Um, but yes, we'll be making this available to all the commission members. I'm not sure what the best way is to do that in terms of access to uh, the document, other than just giving you whatever the final version is and letting you then adapt it uh, if you need to. So, yeah. so Bruce, I wanted to put a, a thought out there, and then we'll get back on onto it. But, but, um, and I know I I haven't been been part of the construction of this, so I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to re, uh, you know, edit it or anything like that. But, but, you know, the commission's work starting going back to January has really followed, I think, a, a design thinking, um, mm -hmm. you know, style mm -hmm. process, which uh, which began with understanding <laughs> the problem. How we went about um, gaining a better understanding of that through through our engagement efforts, uh, the research that was uh, that was done on it, also helping to understand and inform the problem, uh, looking at a variety of solutions, and then and then next steps. And I'm wondering why we wouldn't follow a similar type of um, road for uh, for uh, you know for what you know what we're calling the rotary presentation. No, I think it'd be possible to structure this that way. Yeah. Let me take a shot at that. Okay, that would be great. And then, and then my only my only other comment, and I know Barbara's got her hand up, is that is that um, uh, I, I I've always I I I'd been sort of um, over over years of um, of of school district meeting presentations and business presentations and everything else. Everybody sort of like less words, more, more imagery, more and then talk to talk to the image, talk to the graphics. Um, um, anyway, oh, Barbara, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Dave and Bruce. Um, I love this presentation. I I could see this would be very useful. I was thinking about this. Um, in school districts, particularly that have multiple towns, you know, as I've told you, I was superintendent of one where we had, there were seven districts in our SAU where I was superintendent. How helpful this would be, particularly the graphics to display for everyone to see. But I also was superintendent of a regional system of five towns coming in and the weighted, it would help everybody to uh, better understand how much this town puts in, how much this one does. 
particularly when they are so diverse as in one town next to the next town to the next. This could be a very helpful piece. I thank Bruce and Chris. I think this is wonderful. I've been trying to just do something like this myself. This was phenomenal. And I certainly would love a copy at some point. I just think it's very helpful. The questions are definitely relevant. Um, and I think I also agree, Dave, that a few more, the graphics are the thing people will focus on. Their specific information, their town, and seeing it up there, that would is a big seller and uh, helping us better understand what are the questions and what is it we're trying to propose. So thank you, all of you. And right now, the text that's in these slides actually serves as sort of your talking points if you were to present this to a group. So we could have those talking points on a separate script, as it were, that you would use so that the slides, we don't want to really add too many slides to this, you know, 11 right now, 10 right now. Um, but as we swap out maybe for a few more graphic representations of the data, um, then we can maybe have a separate accompanying script with the kinds of talking points that are in the text right here. Perfect. So um, Rick, you had your hand up and Mel. Yes, I did. I was just going to, if, if it's possible, can I ask Barbara a question? Um, okay. yeah. yeah. So Barbara, Barbara, will you take a question from? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, you have a district, let's say, of five smaller districts within your school organization. And they're all bound by agreement right now, which stipulates what people pay. We've been dealing with this on the education committee for years, and you can't get out unless you have the other four agreeing to the change. Uh, how are we going to get by this threshold where, where we have agreements in place in implementing a, a, a formula based upon what we've been just discussing here in this, in this discussion today? It will be very tricky <laughs> if yeah. you are absolutely right, depending whether it's an AREA agreement or if it's in a regional agreement, depending on the type of agreement that you have, whether you have a weighted vote or not weighted vote, um, you know that when they withdraw, they have to go through quite a process to withdraw. It has to be approved uh, by the state. It's a very lengthy process. Uh, one of our towns um, in, the co in the regional program where it was thought that they might withdraw and went, we went through a year long process. In the end, they realized, oh, we don't want to withdraw. We love it here. We, we, we realize now we, we can't withdraw. Yeah. It's a very, it depends on the kind of agreement that you have. Um, we bring everybody to the table. I think the big issue is communication. I've always felt that. Really laying things out, saying we are all here for your children. We're wanting to offer the best and then very clearly putting it up in a graphic. This is what we can do for your child. And it's made a big difference as long as you continue that communication. I'm getting on a soapbox here, but the big thing is making sure people understand what they've committed to as a system, what their children are going to be receiving because of that commitment, and then how, how everyone can benefit. It's a, it's a long process, but it's one built on, frankly, trust. Now let's put it out there. And that's how you get things done. That's how you get your new building aid. That's how you get all the contracts passed. You know, it's, it is, it's a very tricky process. It really is. <clears throat> I wish I had a magic wand, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's difficult. It is. Great. Thank, thanks, Rick. Thank, uh, thanks, Barbara. Um, Mel, you're uh, muted. Based on the conversation we've had, it would seem to me, Bruce, that as we look at some of these graphs, uh, that uh, if we're going to be talking in a specific area, that we ought to be able to adapt those graphs to highlight the district or the communities that, uh, that we're addressing at that point in time so people can, I think it's a great idea, they can see exactly where their 
where their town is except in that area, or maybe even from a regional standpoint, but somewhere where we can uh, visually present, this is where we are in, in, the, in the quadrant, et cetera, so they can have an understanding of where they stand. Now that doesn't mean <clears throat> that's, that is irrelevant, that's relevant only to that and irrelevant to everybody else, but I think it gives a, a more of a visual presentation. So we need to be uh, uh, able to do that. The other thing I think that the engagement group needs to begin to think about now that we're entering the final phase here, we need to begin to identify where we want to have these, uh, these uh, presentations made. Uh, there obviously are particular groups that um, have a keen interest in this, the Business and Industry Association, for example, comes up grant. The, the Business and Educational Coalition is another example of uh, groups that we can identify to make sure that, that uh, we, bring this, we bring this information to uh, increase their IQ as relates to the whole issue of school funding. And that's a, I think that's a task for the engagement group to really begin to uh, have. And also I think for commission members, if there, are, if there are groups specifically that you're related to or that you know of, that we need to begin to extend ourselves to let us know that either by emailing me or Bruce so that we can have a chance to uh, broaden that, uh, that sphere of uh, who we need to be talking with. Mel, I think that's a great idea. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad um, uh, you're willing to take, uh, to take on at least sort of laying out that, that, uh, that plan for, um, uh, for this. And, uh, and, you know, certainly I think one of the, one of the, uh, early um, audiences for this would would be um, would be uh, uh, some of the you know industry groups, uh, the legislature, uh, things like that. But but also recognizing that that this is going this isn't an this isn't going to be an overnight uh, right. deal, yeah. um, and that and that you know so d don't think that we all have to be up morning, noon, and night giving presentations to everybody you know by the end of February. Um, well, I, I think one, one of the reality checks too, and I think uh, 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 Jay mentioned this earlier, you know, this, this report is going to be issued in, in, an, in an environment, a budget environment that is going to be very restrictive. And so as we, as we, I see, I see uh, Mary shaking her head, she as on the budget committee, uh, as we begin to get, get into this, there's a reality check that we have here. And that's why I think, David, your comment about some kind of a phase in program of people realizing that what we're providing here is a foundation, a foundation to begin to look at this long term. And that as we begin to phase this stuff in over a long period of time, it has a much better sense of reality than somebody saying, oh, boy, we're going to have this done the first year, uh, knowing full well the legislative process that has to go through the budgetary process that has to go through. That is a, a perceptual screen that we have to have as I think as a commission as we as we go forward with this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and, um, and 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 you know I think as 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 everybody probably is 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 learning. Not only is it a a, a budget restricted environment for this uh, for this year, but uh, Rick, you've 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 probably also heard the issues surrounding the LOB. <laughs> and the air quality in, in there sure. and the, uh, so um, so you know we're it, it it's it's going to be very very challenging to to try to take on um, big complex pieces of legislation when you've got so many restrictions in terms of um, the ability to hold hearings and and uh, well David I don't think the rest of the the, the non legislators here may not understand what you just said, because what we discovered this past week through our respective caucuses is that the legislative office building does not have any air quality control other than opening the windows. And so as a result of that, all of our committees, if the committees are gonna be meeting someplace, which is still COVID restricted, it has to be outside the legislative office building. So there's a, there's a the leadership right now in the House is trying to figure out exactly how that, in fact, might mm -hmm. happen if we are to physically get together. Yeah. Mel, you know, the, the issue we're going to have is you, you experienced it and I've experienced it. 
some of these issues, we can fill the whole general courtroom up right. on a hearing. Yeah. On this, we're impacting the entire state. Right. Yeah, we right. might as well rent out the Whittemore Center. Or, <laughs> or, I don't or, think for, it's for the football it. stadium. Wildcat yeah. Stadium. Yeah. yeah. But you're right. I mean, you know, we 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 filled up the uh, we filled up reps hall about bobcats. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the the there there's a lot of practical considerations uh, that are that. So I, you know, how we go about doing this um, uh, is going to be tied to a lot of things. Anyway, we're using up valuable time, and we've got a couple of uh, any anything else on um, on on this uh, presentation. Uh, we can get get comments to Bruce and and Carrie, and um, um, and uh, and we, we can we can give it another look see and and um, and uh, get to when do you, when do we want to have a final wrap on on this Bruce? Well, the first thing I have to figure out is what it's going to take to customize those graphics to put in local data by county or by region. <clears throat> so we got to get through that. I'll reframe this a bit around the design thinking process to reflect that work that we did. Um, I, I, as, as you all understand, Carrie and I and Jordan are all this week and over the coming weeks supporting the work groups, uh, helping with the briefs, the categorical aid briefs that are also being written this week. So it'll probably take us this week, in addition to those other tasks, to, to go to the next um, version of this Rotary Club presentation. Um, we will be doing something tomorrow night, as I said, with the school and municipal leaders that will be somewhat similar to what you just saw, and perhaps some more detail, but the guidance today has been helpful in terms of making sure it's as useful as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, how about how about this? We've got, um, uh, we're at about three, a little after 3.30. Um, what if we rent, went into the review of key policy questions and um, everybody can sort of see the um, the 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 pathway, the the work path, taking us through the um, uh, the final report. We can talk about those on Thursday a little bit in um, in fiscal policy. But but I think what 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 we in fiscal in the work groups, uh, the three work groups that are going to meet on Thursday, uh, is everybody meet three work groups meeting on Thursday? Yes. Yeah. And. Um, uh, but I think what's Im what's important now, because I think those work groups are really in their final task, are going to be looking at the key questions, which uh, which we've got on the, the 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 tail end of our agenda today. So I I think we sh should we use our time to look at those key questions. We're not are, we're not debating the key key questions, but look you know are they key questions? Are we missing key questions? Uh, do they need to be um, changed in any way and then the work so the work groups can begin taking those up in their next couple of meetings or can can take them up in their next couple of meetings is that a way good way to proceed right now bruce it is for me i'm just looking for okay. nods on the other okay <clears throat> all right so and I'll just, um, again this is um this is this is also a work in progress um some of these questions are more important than others. Some will be answered in the end and some will not, uh, but each of the work groups will have to sort of sift through and set priorities for which of these we have the data to answer them, which of these are, are, are demand our time, their priorities for addressing and which ones might be answered actually at some point in the future by another legislative committee uh, or other analysis. I will note that I've already added one to the fiscal policy group it just was not included on here because there are so many questions before us, um, but we don't have a question and uh, a pending question um, to tackle under fiscal policy on what might be the effect of local, local tax caps on our revenue and distribution models. So I think there's an answer to that, but we just, that's another paragraph in the final report because communities do use local property, use local tax caps and they're gonna wanna know what, how is this going to work if there's a different kind of statewide property tax that funds public education? And if we're also trying to smooth out the disparities, how do local tax caps intersect with the perpetuation or solution to uh, disparities in the capacity to raise money? So, so do we want to put these up on the screen? 
Sure, I can do that if you want to go through them. Let's see, they're right here. Oh, let me go up to the top. <clears throat> and, and in any given week, this will change because we will have hopefully addressed more questions as we, as we move along. And everybody has a copy of this, was sent this as an attachment mm -hmm. with today's agenda as well. And this will be included, of course, in the minutes for the meeting. So public has easy access to this. Looks like Iris raised her hand. Sorry, I can't see everybody's hand, but uh, Iris, please, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, just make sure I'm unmuted. Um, I'm interested in this uh, phase in and uh, wondering who's working on that? Is that being worked on in the fiscal group? Uh, are we going to be working on it as a commission in the whole? Um, I understand the rationale behind having a phase in, given the environment in which we're working, um, but I do have some concerns that a five-year phase in means having to get the agreement of three different legislative bodies in a row, and um, that makes things more complicated. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we're going to discuss it, what its features are, how we learn about it, what's happening on this. <laughs> yeah, so I think we'll be talking about it in fiscal policy and in adequacy and at the full commission uh, level and, and probably we'll, we'll, um, we'll be uh, seeing some ideas on paper when it gets to the commission so that, so that we're not just uh, kicking around um, uh, ideas, but can actually uh, tune on something. But, but Iris, I think your, your, uh, your, your comments are right on that, that when you take a look at a five-year phase and, or you look at what Massachusetts is doing with a seven-year phase, and that certainly involves a lot of different legislative um, sessions. And, um, and, and of course, uh, you know, future legislatures can't be bound to what other legislatures do so i know that very well <laughs> yeah so so um uh, but uh, you know but you know also we're, we're 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 still learning a lot about what what might be able to be accomplished even this coming legislative session and um and obviously this isn't this isn't the best um i mean this is a challenging time uh, for a lot of things not just money wise but but uh, just from a, 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 a policy debate uh, standpoint. So, um, so yeah, we're going to have, we'll, we'll have to have these discussions. Um, and, and I think what a lot of people have, have probably seen over the last few weeks too, is that um, uh, work group meetings have started to look maybe a little more like commission meetings with, 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 um, uh, Adequacy, talking about fiscal policy things. Fiscal policy, talking about adequacy things. So, um, so please, even if you're not on a work group, uh, it doesn't really matter if if you're interested in what what uh, what's on the agenda. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe now is a good time to make sure that uh, that that all commission members get agendas of all the work group meetings. Just uh, you know, uh, just so they can see what's going on and can decide whether or not to, to jump on them. They're, they're, obviously all the agendas have always been on the website, but um, uh, I'll start doing that. Uh, Jordan, all, right. Can start doing that. all right, great. I, I know Jordan and I have actually talked about that a couple of times. Um, yeah, it's time to do it. <laughs> but yeah, all right. Uh, um, I don't see everybody's hand, but I heard Jay, yeah. yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, so I think uh, the question that Iris wants to discuss on phasing, I think, is uh, a good one for us to discuss. Uh, and I know how uh, eager we will be to do that. Um, I also am apprehensive that it could drown out the very important conversations and uh, recommendations that we're trying to formulate on principles. And, uh, and so I just want to say from my, my concern is that uh, we fail to have a set of principles that regardless of funding level, 
uh, we're going to want to uh, uh, continue to communicate. Uh, they'll, they'll be the foundation of whatever uh, uh, I propose anyway, and I suspect you know, what, what other legislators are looking for uh, to ground themselves in the study that we've done. So um, I just, the next, the next uh, commission meeting on the uh, second, uh, I, I really hope that we bring those principles forward without getting into the phasing conversation. And I know uh, it's a, gonna feel a little late to get to it on the 16th, but uh, I, I think, you know, maybe work groups can deal with this on the 9th. Uh, uh, and the, yeah, you, you get the point. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I, this is Bill, can I support Jay's point? Uh, yeah. I think Jay is dead on right. I think that in this draft, which is just a work in progress, there are a couple of, you know, it, it looks like it's trying to address principles, but it's torn you know, it's contemplating something that is more detailed, like a piece of legislation. And I understand from the legislator's perspective on the commission that, you know, that your minds are very focused on what the ultimate product might be in terms of, you know, House Bill 100 uh, to reform education funding. But I think the commission, uh, its, its work, which is limited, it has limited time left, would be much better focused on getting core principles that are uh, on the table to discuss and decide whether we can agree on. And, and those principles are, are touched on in this list, but some like phasing are, I mean, the, the most I think this commission should deal with is to say, we think that you know, an appropriate transition process should be considered so that no school district is left in the lurch by a shock change as a result of a shift in law. And right. because otherwise it's, if we spend our time trying to, and you know, I say this as someone who has put together several pieces of written legislation dealing with school funding plans over the years that, that we'll never ever get yeah. there. It is too yeah. hard in the amount of time. So I, I totally agree with Jay and I would urge that these, I have a couple of extra principles that I think should be addressed on this, but I think uh, Dave Luno, I, I really think we should, as a commission, talk about what our work product is working yeah. towards. Yeah. Realistic. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I totally agree with that and made comments to um, Bruce and Dave about not having that chapter in the report uh, stages of implementation. I think the idea of implementation principles is fine, but I think it's just a distraction and would, would narrow our conversation. So, you no, know, Chris and, and Bill and Jay, no, thanks, thanks for that. And it's good to be sort of yanked back to, um, what we need to, uh, you know, document in the report as far as as far as principles, and um, that uh, that uh, any sort of plan moving forward, whether it happens this session, next session, you know, future sessions, uh, can rely on and um, and uh, so thanks. No, I the, let's so Bill, if you can make sure that that we have those additional. Uh, core questions, uh, we can make sure that, um, that, that those are the things that we stay focused on. Yeah, please, please send any, any of you, please send drafts, edits, ideas. Again, this is absolutely a work in progress. And I do appreciate this. Let's put those core principles back up on top. It does have to be an important part of the report itself. And any policy recommendations, statutory recommendations need to flow from those principles. If the, the it goes if the commission members can't agree on the basic core principles, any effort to work on details is wasted. So we got to put that out there. Make sure people can say yes or no on that, and and then um, only then Bruce really can a report start to get drafted. We need a term sheet of principles. So Kareem. Um, I, 
well, first I had a question for Mel to consider when we meet with engagement Thursday to, um, once you put the agenda to, together um, to consider adding time, an extra hour, because we've got some big things we need to kind of go over and discuss. And then I'm wondering on this founding principles, I think that we do have to come out as a commission as to, this is what we all agree on to move um, a change in school funding formula and wondered if each of our subgroups should have that conversations and develop, you know, our overarching principles uh, the way that we see it and then bring it to full commission so that we do come to consensus so that at some point after a, such a discussion in a meeting that we all say, okay, we all stand strong that all communities should have equal opportunities and our kids should all have equal opportunities. We, we you know, the whatever the founding principles are that we believe is going to provide a constitutionally valid funding formula is part of those principles. So just a suggestion, not a process. No, I think that's right because we're each work group should be developing its own report or find set of findings uh, over the next basically two weeks. Um, so two weeks from today at our next, uh, let's see, that's a work group day. Um, you'll be, you know, be sure that you include your own uh, set of core principles. Now, in the meantime, um, I'll be with Carrie and Jordan, Dave and Jay and Mel, we'll draft some overriding uh, guiding principles here. And these will all be familiar to you. I think they've all been a part of our conversation for the past six or seven months. But if there are specific principles at the adequacy level, at the fiscal policy level, and at the engagement level, then each work group could put forward. It's not gonna, you know, three or four. It's not, it shouldn't be a laundry list. It shouldn't be um, so many that they, they're meaningless. But what are the most important principles to guide policy um, with from each of the work group's perspectives? Um, just to point out, we've got a April 12th, uh, <laughs> we've got a November 12th uh, meeting. Right. And, and right. that that one could be a key date for uh, what work groups are, you know, needing to have full commission discussion of work group recommendations. Yeah, and if you look at today's agenda, that's exactly right. November twelfth, um, an additional commit. That's a Thursday, by the way. So make mm -hmm. sure you have your calendars to discuss the work group reports or draft reports. Good, uh, uh, Corrine. Yeah. Um, just, just to add while I while you're talking, I was just thinking about this. I mean, we don't even. Well, I don't even know for sure if everybody supports a performance based system versus the input basis. So, to me, that would be one really key principle for us to we, have a conversation. We, we, on we did, the commission did have kind of a what I'll call a straw yeah. vote on that. Straw vote, right, right. Three meetings ago, and uh, yep. the large majority of folks were comfortable with moving forward with that. Right. But I think I think Corrine's point is well taken, Bruce, that it, it really, I think, needs to be a simple principle in writing yeah. that goes out to members before a meeting so they can look at it and they probably call each other once in a while. I'll bother Chris Dwyer really uh, huffily or something on a piece of language. We'll chat. But I think, and then you come to the commission meeting with the clear, because otherwise, like Corrine says, did we really do this or did yeah. we just chat right. about it? What's the role of a straw poll? I think we're coming down to the, the brass tacks, so to speak, and we gotta be more precise. Yeah. Uh, and I mean that in a very positive way. I mean, I think we've right. accomplished a great deal. I, it is not a critical way. It just says, I think, you know, having brought multi-party deals together, I think we've got to try and put something on paper here that is actually the language that we're thinking of. Uh, All right, so, so why, don't, why, don't we, why don't we do this? Why don't we um, uh, put down the, um, uh, uh, Jay Mel and I'll work with uh, Bruce Jordan Carey, put down the dozen core principles and a description 
of these. I don't think we need 30 or 50 core principles, no. but, but about a dozen of them. And, um, and uh, they'll, they'll cover a lot of the, they'll cover all of the major things we've, we've talked about. Uh, short description of, of each and, um, and those are the things that we can, uh, we can take up at the work groups and, and the commission. If I could that suggest to you that that's a great idea, if I could just add to it, that as the three of you leaders are going through that, you've heard everybody uh, on the commission and their concerns. It'd be great to tag where you think there's a principle that you wanna lay out in the affirmative, tag a note that says, that identifies, uh, you know, I may, you know, that Ardinger guy might have a concern about this principle. Yeah, yeah. Just a little, not the person, but their, what their substance of their concern might be. Uh, and, and so that it triggers, um, you know, a free flow getting meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good thought, good thought. Yeah, and All right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and David, David, as much as, you know, we, we uh, I think this Thursday's work group meetings are really gonna be important. A lot of people have, teed up various conversations that do have principles behind them. And they not, and they, we, we may wind up with a dozen that, you know, in aggregate kind of uh, uh, can be moved to uh, three or four broader ones under which there are more specifics down uh, within the body of the report. But I, I, I don't want to disrupt uh, too much of the work group flow. I know you don't either. And I know the tax policy is going to, uh, our fiscal policy is going to deal with a lot of those questions that are on the, the, the page. So uh, of, of key questions, so, you know, we got to keep, uh, uh, it, I know we're all committed to this and we, we need to, we, we need to uh, use the, those conversations to get more pointed to outcome, uh, you know, recommendations. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, great. Um, anybody have anything else they want to add while we're right here? Because I would uh, like to get to um, um, uh, public comment while we've got a few minutes left of the meeting. Um, everybody good? I saw somebody with a license plate said cool beans on it uh, yesterday. So everybody cool beans. <laughs> Did I properly use that? I think so. <laughs> All right. Your um, kids will tell you that you didn't, Dad. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know superintendents that use that term. Um, all right, so um, let's see. Let me just get back to our agenda here. So um, um, I think at this point we're going to swing it uh, into uh, into uh, comments from members of uh, of the uh, community, attendees that have been with us. Uh, I thank them for uh, for hanging with us uh, this afternoon, and um, and I guess before we open the door to that, I'd like to remind everybody that we do have an extended public comment period on Wednesday, this Wednesday from from four to five. So um, so and I think that's that's uh, generally open to uh, 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 to members of the public. So uh, so there's that and. Uh, and happy to welcome uh, any of our attendees who are with us today that um, that want to share a thought with the um, uh, with the with the group here. Welcome them around the table. All they need to do is click on um, on uh, raising their hand, or is it? Or if they're on, I don't know if anybody's dialed in. I don't really see anybody dialed in. Um, uh, but if if you were dialed in, it would be a star nine. Star nine to raise your hand. So, not seeing anybody. Uh, Jordan, you're looking at the dashboard there. I am looking. I do not see anyone. With, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Leslie. We've got Leslie's. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Leslie, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for this meeting. I, I applaud you all for the work you're doing. I'm here in Manchester on the school board and I wanted to just also emphasize, I think the importance of having those principles behind the work 
I think that was a really big takeaway from this meeting and I can't tell you how much, how important I think that is. So thank you for that. Great, great. That was basically it. Thank you all for everything you're doing. This is a great. really great task. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for your work on the Manchester board. Of course. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. We'll uh, just give it a little bit here, see if any other hands um, uh, come up. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul has uh, raised his hand. Hi, hi, Paul. Welcome again. Good to see you. Not getting audio. Jordan, what's... Uh, Not sure. Paul, you seem unmuted now. Maybe an audio issue on your yeah. end. Do you have your microphone? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I think we got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about the technical uh, aspect. Uh, again, representing the town of Newington and, and uh, in today's discussion on, on principles uh, underlying the commission's work, um, I do appreciate that's a challenge. Uh, but I do hope uh, one of those principles that doesn't get lost is the um, understanding that uh, communities differ significantly in their tax base, both uh, in terms of their town-to-town, uh, uh, -town, municipal and municipalities uh, tax base, but also within each town. Uh, the, the, the makeup of a community um, that may appear property rich uh, could be much different from another community uh, in that same category. Um, I won't pick out individual communities at this moment, but in Newington's case, um, due to the commercial base that we have, we appear to be a property rich um, uh, location. And if we're not changing the source of the funding, um, then uh, we're still relying on the property tax and that can be troublesome as you all recall. Uh, so trying to create one of those founding principles that uh, avoids a donor town situation um, that also understands that uh, uh, you gotta be careful not to kill the golden goose because um, if taxes get too high, uh, businesses and commercial uh, owners will will uh, devalue and leave. Um, so there's, there's other, uh, counterbalancing issues that, that need to be understood and appreciated and at least acknowledged in uh, the commission's report, I hope. And I've seen some of the uh, documents that and reports you've been studying, uh, still wading through it myself. So, but I do appreciate and uh, want to point that out again to the commission, uh, those concerns. Great, thanks. Thank you for bringing those up again, Paul. And uh, it's good for all of us to be reminded that uh, that, that New Hampshire is not a, uh, a, a homogenous state, nor are the towns that are that are in New Hampshire. So, um, uh, so th thanks very much, Paul. You're welcome. So let's see. Coming on just after four o'clock. I don't know if the school bells rung yet. I see Iris's hand. No, all right, okay. Well, um, next uh, next public comment period will be Wednesday, four o'clock. I think we're, um, are we all set until then? Yeah, Bruce, we're good. I think so, good, good, good discussion today and um, got some work to do. We all have work to do, so. All right, and then and uh, people, folks working on the um, the uh, categorical aid briefings, uh, uh, please keep working on those. We'll be uh, giving a, a first look at those on Thursday, right? Right. So, all right, and any any questions uh, about those? I know Bruce Bruce did email out a um, um, sort of a, a a a flow for those uh, for those briefs. But uh, but please don't hesitate to reach out. I think I think we've got multiple people working on each. So um, 
So at least we've got uh, mm -hmm. we've got teams to uh, to move those forward. So good, good. All right. Any anybody else with uh, with um, um, anything for the good of the cause? Very good. Uh, great. Until uh, Wednesday. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.